Except, uh, is it Danny? Yeah. You're, are you in Maryland? Yeah, I live right outside. Oh, DC. so you're not calling from Austin. No, that's why I, I actually called uh, at the new start time at 5.30 Eastern, and uh, you weren't on, but go yeah. ahead, I got on. Well, we're on now, so we thank you for being the first caller at the new start time. What do you got for us? Awesome. Um, well, I, I want to say I'm a, I'm a big fan. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thanks. Um, you know, it's definitely the best atheist show I've ever seen. I've only seen uh, two or three. It's certainly the best one. Well, I'll see I've a few seen. more before you start yeah. calling us best. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to call in because uh, I, I was reading the, the Maryland Constitution a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. and um, I just I, I find the current state of the Constitution in this day and age to be incredibly offensive and and, and very. <sighs> it mentions God uh, several times. I can just read um, under the the Declaration of Rights how it how it begins. It says. We, the people of the state of Maryland, grateful to Almighty God for our civil and religious liberty and taking into our serious consideration the best means of establishing a good constitution in this state for the sure foundation and more permanent security thereof declare. And then, um, you know, a bunch of the articles refer to God explicitly. Right. And um, That's actually articles, pretty common. Is, is it common? Yeah, and in Texas... Um, in the Texas Constitution, it says that nobody can hold public office, or nobody can be prevented from holding public office based on their religious beliefs. And then at mm -hmm. the end, it says, provided they believe in a God. Right, um, okay. Now, that's that's that, exactly what the Maryland Constitution right. says. Yeah, and, and, and that, there, I can't remember the exact Supreme Court ruling. Actually, I, um, I think it was Torcaso v. Watkins. Torcaso Watkins? Yeah, um, that overturned it. You, you, you may actually be right, but I... I I don't have them all memorized. Uh, but one of the Supreme Court decisions, and, and it may be Tarkas if you was, Watson, so you may want to look that up, uh, basically rendered that null and void. Um, it's, it, it is not allowed for a state's constitution uh, to enforce as law something that would be a violation of the U.S. Constitution. And okay. so while those things still exist in the constitutions, they have no teeth, they can't be enforced um, yeah, I'd love for, you know, ideally I'd love for somebody to go in and rip them out. Uh, but right. the problem is, is the way things are structured, the only way to actually rip them out would be to propose a constitutional amendment and get that through and voted on. And that, t that costs time and money. It may actually not pass despite the fact that this is unconstitutional and, and has no business being in there. So you may just end up spinning your wheels going in circles trying to remove something that, you know, if the majority of the people don't want it removed, uh, it's not going to happen even though it's unconstitutional. Okay. All right. That's, that's I guess, interesting. To know can we get a little more volume? I'm having a hard time hearing Danny. I can speak up. I speak quietly. Oh, that'd be, that's I've been great. told that. <laughs> That's great. Um, I had another question for Matt. Uh, I, I saw on some of the shows I've been able to catch on the podcast that you were in the military. Mm -hmm. um, were you an atheist while you were in the military? No. Or? No. no? I was. She was. How, how is it viewed in the military? Because I have a few friends that are going into the military this year that are atheists. Yeah. Um, you know, when I originally joined the military, it was... It, I don't know, it, it, it was really kind of a non-issue. There's always been this sort of ceremonial deism that was present in some of the ceremonies and everything, but it was not overtly um, a, a religious expression, you know. It was, it was sort of like the same kind of ceremonial deism that you see in like the Declaration of Independence or something. Um, okay. As time went on, it got more and more overt. Um, the evangelical crowd kind of dug their heels in and started doing their evangelizing. and. And by the time I left, um, it was actually a pretty uncomfortable situation for atheists. Um, okay. It, it, to the point where, I mean, every, every, um, every parade, every change of command, everything had, had overtly religious activities inserted in it. And that's actually not part of the military history. So they, it's couldn't, not, they couldn't fall it's back. It's a more on recent this. phenomenon. Pardon me? I said, is it, it's a more recent phenomenon that they do. Uh, I would say that it, that it has picked up 
probably uh, slowly, but probably in the last 15 years or so, it's gotten much more overt. Okay, because uh, yeah, all the time there's uh, you know Navy parties and Army parties and such right right around D.C. in the same areas that I socialize in, and they're they're very denominational type uh, parties and activities that I that I always see associated with the military. So I was just curious how that went over in the military. Yeah, and you you even have some commanders who think that they can. Um, like uh, an, an episode that happened when I was um, still in the reserves, uh, a brigade commander tried to um, have the chaplain come in and lead a prayer before each of his staff calls. Mm -hmm. well, you can't do that. Yeah. Officers don't come to staff call either voluntarily or because they want to have a prayer meeting. Okay. They come to so, staff call to do the brigade's business, and that's not um, praying to whatever deity the commander believes in. And there's actually uh, a couple of the lawsuits going on now with regard to this, the, the, the problems in the military with regard to religion and atheism. Um, there's a young private from Kansas that's suing, um, and I, he's received death threats and another, a number of other problems. Um, and there's, there's somebody else who just recently sued um, for, uh, because they were being forced to attend uh, services. And, and, and the problem... Yeah, this is relatively recent. It's certainly gotten worse over the last 15, 20 years, whatever. Um, but it, it branches out from just the daily activities of individual soldiers, sailors, marine, and airmen. Right. Uh, it you had the problems at the Air Force Academy where you had evangelical Christians who were essentially hazing uh, non-believers and Jews in particular. Um, right. And that was exposed. Um, and then you have high-ranking military chaplains who write books that say uh, atheists can't be good soldiers and then they, they get an endorsement from General Petraeus for example um, and, and this you know there are two of the you know the the highest ranking individual with regard to our efforts in in Iraq and Afghanistan at the present time um, and a very high-ranking chaplain one of them is making this statement that is uh, divisive, untrue. Uh, it it maligns many good uh, military personnel, and one of them is making the statement, and the other one is endorsing it. Um, granted, he endorsed the the book on the whole, but it it would surprise me. Well, maybe you know, maybe he didn't read it, but that's irresponsible as well. Uh, and so, yeah, there is. There is this problem within the military. Now, I'm not saying it's necessarily terrible for everybody. Um, there are plenty of people in the military with who probably never have any issue at all. Um, one of the things that Oak talked about, he, he was retired. He was in for 30 years. He got out before some of the more recent things uh, have happened. But his point was that you know he never really had any issues. He was an atheist the, the entire time and never had an issue. Um, but... The you know I, you hear it all the time this you know no atheists in foxholes nonsense and even when we saw religious the other night um, there was somebody in there who made a comment along those lines of you know or or maybe it was another thing that I was watching where where somebody basically said you know you you when you're under fire um, I, there are no atheists in foxholes and type thing well that's not true there are atheists in foxholes and uh, Pat Tillman for example. Um, I was just thinking of him. Yeah, I've who seen was him portrayed as incredibly spiritual by some propaganda, and I find it ridiculous. And yeah. he was quite an atheist; like he he made no bones about it. Yet they still portray him as a spiritual person who died for this and that when he died because he believed in fighting for his country and for no other reason. And I and and if you believe the reports, if the reports about what happened are accurate, um, you know, at the time under fire when people around him were losing their head and calling out to their God, he's the one who smacked them to attention and said, hey, we've got to take care of ourselves here um, and you know, focus on the task at hand. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't want to make that sound like, you know, oh, it's not the atheists that are weak, it's the religious people that are weak. That's, that's not the point. The, the, the point is that from a practical standpoint, a secular point of view, allows you to deal with reality on reality's terms. Um, yeah, you know, if you believe something and it, and it gives you hope or comfort, you know, good for you. 
um, as long as those beliefs don't dictate actions that affect other people. Once that happens, um, I, I'm no longer just going to say it's okay for you to have those beliefs because it's not okay. Um, right. if, if your beliefs wind up costing other people their lives or taking away and preventing other people's rights and freedoms, that's a big problem. Right. Okay. And I had uh, just, just one more question. I don't want to take up sure. all your time. And said, well, nobody um, else has called yet, so. Okay. Well, okay then. Um, well, I'm... I uh, majored in philosophy and uh, sociology both, and so I, I had, you know, to do a lot of reading through, from all ages, since the beginning of writing, basically. And it, it seems to me that culture to culture and, and globally, when a mindset is replaced, which is a religious mindset is replaced, it's replaced by another religious mindset. And do you ever think there'll come a time where it'll re be replaced by a a secular rationality rather than another religious dogmatic mindset because it seems we're running out of places for theists to go after their their uh, mindsets and dogmas get, get overturned. Yeah. Um, I'd certainly like to think that that's what... Well, I, I do think that for the most part with most people is, is what will eventually happen. When it'll happen, uh, whether or not I'll be alive to even get a whiff of that is, is another thing. But... There's another problem to this, and that is when you, when you look at kind of from an anthropological standpoint of how we've invented gods. We talked about this a little bit yesterday on the nonprofit show. Um, okay. We used to invent gods that were very specific and filled very specific niches. And then once science and our understand, or science prompted our understanding of, the re of, of reality, um, we found out, well, you know, uh, Zeus isn't really throwing lightning bolts. Um, and there isn't really a God that drags the sun around the earth because the earth goes around the sun and et cetera, et cetera. And so those gods get replaced by gods that are gradually more uh, nebulous. Uh, and that's, so you get, you get towards the, the modern area where you have um, a lot of people who buy into a monotheistic, or I guess maybe we should say pseudo-monotheistic, considering right. you know, yes. everything else. But, but, but their view of God is that God is um, transcendent, it transcends time, reality, whatever the heck that is, and how, how they come up with it. But they've defined their God in such a way that it, uh, it is very unlikely to be disproven by simple discoveries, that it's something that ends up just being taken on faith. They don't need any rational justification for it. And so it's really difficult to eradicate ideas like that. And the next step, which we're seeing more of now, I think, um, is the people who, who'd say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Now they've right. just defined everything away and they've come up with a term that's really meaningless, um, yeah, that know. even they probably don't have a good definition for. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual. I've got, I, I don't even want to try and describe it because no matter how many times I ask for people to explain it, nobody can. I heard you guys get into that last week with your uh, "What does it mean?" Um, yeah, episode, and, and yeah, I've been, I've encountered that quite a bit, and it it becomes uh, frustrating because I have you know really good friends that that don't even believe that Jesus is the Son of God and and still claim to be Christians, and I I can't for the life of me figure out why they're holding on to the dogma when they reject the basic tenets of the dogma, which is, if you push most, most theists, they, they end up rejecting some of the, the basic and major tenets of their dogma, like the foundations of their dogma, mm -hmm. yet they still try to hold on to the fact that, you know, their beliefs are founded in something, and it, it, I just find it incredibly frustrating. Well, I, I think that part of the reason people cling so tenaciously to religious beliefs, even in the face of of overwhelming evidence that what they believe probably isn't true. I think it's this, it's an almost childish need for certainty in their lives. You know, and, and science doesn't give you any certainties. We deal in uh, probabilities, but we try to quantify our uncertainties when we talk about things. I, I work as an engineer, so uh, everything I do is subject to some degree of uncertainty. Well, right. I'm comfortable with that because I can quantify that uncertainty and then use it um, to inform my decisions. And I think what you have a lot of people um, dealing with is that they can't deal with the level of uncertainty about, you know, w w what happens after you die or, 
You know, what if there is no God? What if we're really all alone in the universe? And, and so these things cause, I don't know, some kind of personal crisis or whatever. And so when it comes to taking that next step and, and rejecting religious claims, I just can't do it. And, and I'm probably oversimplifying a lot of what happens there, but that's something that seems to come up over and over again when people email us. You know, we try to pin them down to get them to describe their beliefs and explain, you know, what it is, what, what are you asking? You know, what's the question here? And it gets right down to... Um, they need to know for sure something, and there aren't any for sures in life. I understand that. But there, there are some incredibly, incredibly close to for sures. Like I, you know, I've talked many times on the show um, about how I reject the idea of absolute certainty. So when people come and say, uh, like Bill Maher's done recently, that you know atheists are just as bad yeah. as, as the religious folks because they claim absolute. I don't claim absolute certainty that that there yeah. are no gods. I just happen. Well, first of all, atheism is simply a lack of belief or a lack of acceptance of the claim that gods exist. I go a step further. There. Sorry? I said I completely agree there that yeah. atheism doesn't put forth any positive beliefs. It's just the rejection of theism. I actually go the step further um, towards strong atheism, and I would say that I actively believe that there are no gods. Can I Same prove book. this? Can I demonstrate it? No. Um, is it anything I claim with an extremely high degree of certainty? Um, pretty high, but n not nearly so high as things that you know we we learn about reality from from science. There are some things. I mean, you can you can throw a cotton ball at me uh, using whatever weaponry you want, as long as the cotton ball is the only thing in there. You don't like hide something behind it. You cannot possibly get that thing. Uh, going fast enough to do me any real harm. There's just not enough mass there. We understand that. Now, there could be, you know, a freak accident, you know, gunpowder or whatever sticks, mm -hmm. sticks to it and, and turns it into a better projectile. But in those specific circumstances wh where just the cotton ball is going to impact me, um, there's simply no way, uh, you, know, you know, practical or possibly otherwise, for it to do harm. So that's, about, that's like way up there at the at the damn near certain, yeah. if not really certain, level. I'm in that exact same boat. I, I guess I would be considered an anti-theist, but um, I, I certainly believe that every single conception of God that I've ever been presented with, which is a lot from you know, Judaism to yeah. Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, etc., and I believe that they're all easily refutable. And so in that case, I... I can say that there's no God, and the tripartite God of omniscient, omnipotent, and uh, benevolent, I also believe is, is a logical fallacy. Yeah. So in that, if that's how people are going to decide God, then, I mean, determine God, I, I can say that there is no God. And I, I actually wrote my um, sociology dissertation on um, American students and the, the rise of fundamentalism mm -hmm. and the increase in the population that, that believes they know basically everything for certain because the Bible is a fact and, and how that is affecting our our public education and why we're ranked as low as we're ranked in, in most standardized testing. Yep, definitely. And that is that, that such a, <laughs> excuse me, a mindset in which you believe you know everything, you know, even from the time you're five, six, seven years old, you know everything and, right. and brilliant physicians, brilliant, you know, physicists, brilliant biologists, they don't know anything. They've got it all wrong. Yeah, and that's the, that that's is a the dangerous mindset thing. going up against you know other countries that that don't produce children with a mindset that produce children that have an inquisitive mind. Yeah, and, 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 and what you're talking about is really important, and it's an important distinction. Um, yes, I'll freely admit um, I don't just not believe in a god. I actually believe there are no gods. Um, the difference between me and somebody who says they believe in a god is that um, I don't pretend. To know this for certain, I don't right. pretend that I can necessarily demonstrate that claim with any evidence. It's just my uh, view based on the assessment and the. Uh, there, there are some good reasons, and I think I can make a good case for it. But the other thing is, um, my position, like any scientific position, is tentative. Um, the minute, the second that I am presented with evidence and reason, argument that I'm wrong, then my belief changes. Um, right. I don't dogmatically cling on to anything. I, you know, oh, well, you know, science is your religion. No, I don't have any religion <laughs> at all. I trust science because it is 
consistently demonstrated that it's the single most reliable way of discovering the truth about reality. Does it get it wrong sometimes? Sure, but the only thing you can correct science with is more science. Right. So. Well, and, and Danny, one of the things that you brought up here, uh, it's, it's kind of important when you're talking about teaching kids and the rise of fundamentalism. I mean, we get some of the some email once in a while with people asking, "Hey, what's the harm in people believing these right. religious things?" I mean, as long as they're not pushing them on us, what's the big deal? And the big deal is that anything that erodes your ability to to think critically about things is harmful. It's not just a benign belief; it's actively harmful. And that's what people are doing to their kids when they infect them with these beliefs. You have this special category of beliefs that are not subject to any kind of questioning. And so, you know, you see it in every sphere, whether it's science or history or, or anything else. People will look at, you know, historical claims of accuracy for the Bible. And right. you can look at, at, you know, some events in the Bible we can validate through extra biblical resources. And so the people that claim that the Bible is historically accurate will accept that. And they'll even cite that evidence. Yeah. Oh, see, the Bible's historically accurate. But then when you, you have other science, the same science, same principles, that actively refute a claim in the Bible, for example, the historicity of the Exodus, right. uh, that's been totally demolished, okay? Oh, oh, yeah, definitely. And people will actively reject the very same science that confirms another piece. You know, and so you, you've got this cognitive dissonance at work here and and frankly I don't know how they they can maintain any any type of integrity and and reconcile that except to reject the whole thing yeah. I, I, um, I feel the exact same way um, my, I'm often frustrated by you know r religious people picking and choosing that you know they they'll choose in my opinion the, the Bible certainly says that the earth is is flat you know with the the four corners and, and stuff like that and they'll reject things that yeah, yeah. I mean they'll accept things that that you know, prove the world is spherical, but reject things that are are of the same scientific caliber and uh, you know done by the same scientific method. And it, it, I don't, it, I just, I don't get it sometimes. Or, or they'll come up with something that's that's actively untrue. For example, <coughs> you know, you talk about uh, the claim, you know, that the Earth is flat that you find in the Bible, or, or evidence that that's what the belief was, and then they'll say, oh, but scientists believe that the Earth was flat. You know, up until I forget what the claim is now, it kind of morphs from yeah, from time remember. to time. But uh, the fact is, that's not true. I mean, th the ancient Greeks knew that the Earth wasn't flat. So you know, it's like okay, scientists. I think it was Aristophanes who yeah, so, uh, calculated the, yeah, so, the circumference uh, of the Earth. You know, uh, the the fact that the Earth is not flat has been known for a long time by scientists. You know, and it was not theologians that came up with that. So I think I think what you're talking about, and let me hit this real quick, Danny. We're starting to actually get other calls, so um, uh, I, I hope this will get uh, hit the point. Is um, yeah, there are, the believers. I think some believers are kind of forced to pick and choose because there are areas where the tenets or what the Bible says or whatever their holy book says. Um, for other religions, conflict with what we now know to be true, the scientifically justified understanding of reality. Um, and in the areas where it doesn't matter to their religious point of view and it actually affects their daily lives, they're willing to go along with the science. Right. In the, in the places where it's not going to affect their daily life, in the places where... Um, you know, this is kind of a personal thing. They're willing to disregard science. And we're getting to a point where the distinction between those two is becoming very, very narrow. And we, some of us went and saw Bill Maher's uh, religious list on Friday and some saw it on Saturday. Um, he had Ken Ham from the Creation Museum sitting there talking. And what, what Ken basically did was you know, Bill had asked him, why, why do you believe this, you know, about the flood and the talking snake and Adam and Eve and this? And, and, and I'm, if I'm remembering it right, it was Ken Ham who said this. If not, then it's at least in the movie. Um, the response was, well, if, if that part of the Bible is not true, then I have no reason to believe the other part of the Bible is true. And I immediately, nice and loud, said, amen. 
Exactly. Um, so, but you've got it backwards because you already believe this part. You're forced to mm -hmm. to to believe this other crap uh, in order to maintain consistency, rather than doing what a, an honest, uh, skeptical, critical thinker would would do, which is say, "Wow." He's obviously done it. He's obviously said, well, if this part's not true, then this other part might not be true either. Um, but he's come to the conclusion he doesn't want to get rid of it. So he's going to cling on to these 6,000-year-old earth men walked with dinosaurs, global flood, uh, all of these things that are just absurd in the face of what mankind's learned since the frickin' Bronze Age. Um, <laughs> and, and whereas I would think that most reasonable people um, who aren't being trapped by... Uh, the blinders and fear of religion would say, okay, let me assess this other claim on its own as well. Um, there is some reason to perhaps doubt it, but it's possible that this claim could still be true. It is wrong for him to say that there's two things in the Bible, and if this one's false, this one must be true. There are actually true things in the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not it's you know historically accurate, I mean, who, who knows? But uh, Well, actually, we have ways of verifying well, it's a lot of it, yeah. A lot of it. So, uh, I mean, you know, when they talk about Egypt, well, Egypt was a real place, but that yeah. doesn't prove that what the Bible claims happened there happened. But, yeah. Danny, I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. We really appreciate the call, and uh, okay. and thanks for being the first call on the on the new show. All right, thanks a lot. You guys do a tremendous job. Um, I really appreciate it. You know, even all the way out here. If I was within a thousand miles of Austin, I would come to you to happy hour with you guys. All right. All right. Well, when you get within a thousand miles, I'll hold you to it. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Danny.